Alrighty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, he now do who when a stain who when a stuffer who when I will be lah him in Sharuri and Fusina, women say ye arte a malina. May ya the hilla who fell a mudilla who. Well, may you lil who fell a hadiella. Well, I shall do a la ilaha illa law. Wahda who la sharika la who. Well, I shall do anna Mohammedan Abadu who were a solo solo law while he was seldom. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد All praise be to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness we seek refuge from uh, with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from, the, from our own bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner, and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's servant and messenger. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves, and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. O oh, humanity, be mindful of your creator who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate. And through both, Allah spread countless men and women. And people, be mindful of Allah in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. O oh, ye who believe, be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. Sisters and brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jummah Mubarak to you all. Uh, before I begin, I just want to give full disclosure that the sermon was prepared, quite frankly, as I was looking into the mirror. And uh, what, what, what better view can you ask? No, I'm just playing. Um, but I, I, I was just thinking about it. And I was just thinking as I was just putting this together, what I wanted to say to myself, what I wanted to say to myself amidst everything that's been going on. Sure, sure there has been no shortage of any material um, for us to reflect on. Uh, if we watch the news, if we look at social media, things like that, um, there's ample amount of things for us to kind of sit with and just you know, reflect on. Uh, and what it said, what, what I wanted to say to myself amidst what I was feeling uh, and my sentiments and actions amidst this time that we're in. And it's by no means directed personally at anyone by any means. And as always, it's a collective call. It's, it's, it's uh, what in pastoral uh, work is uh, referred to as uh, wounded healing. You know, we, we all suffer different wounds throughout our journey in life. Uh, and we're not using these to boast to anyone or to uh, put anyone down, but to use these wounds as a means of healing like our Prophet Sallallahu had used. And so uh, as I begin here, it is narrated that the, uh, during the lifetime, uh, during the life of the uh, second Khalifa of Islam, uh, Umar radiallahu an, um, during his Khilafa, uh, when the illustrious cities of Damascus or Tesiphon or Jerusalem and Alexandria, among others, they came under the control of the Muslims. Umar radiallahu an, uh, would visit present day Syria to see some of these cities, um, specifically Damascus and Jerusalem. It is under on one such trip in which he saw that the wealth was brought into the Muslim community, uh, that all this wealth that was brought in and how some of the Sahaba, how some of the Bedouins at the time, the people just living in the deserts of Arabia were now dressing in the finest garments, were living in grander homes than the simpler uh, mud brick abodes in which they, they, they used to call home in the Arabian Peninsula. And as per his character, Omar radiallahu anh, he actually showed disdain for this. And he was, he was a little taken aback. And he said that uh, it had only be, to, to a Sahabi, he had said, 
it's only been a few years, you know, since the Prophet ﷺ had passed. It was like, it's already been a few years and this is what we have kind of already become. Um, that we can't really distinguish ourselves from uh, those um, who we have, uh, who, who, whose cities we've entered. And, um, and remarking that, you know, despite the fact that it only been a few years since the process of had passed, but now that it seemed that Muslims had become preoccupied with the world, or at least seeming to prefer it. And the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu came to mind, whether to him at this time, but certainly to us here, but that in which the Prophet Sallallahu had said, by Allah, it is not poverty I fear for you, not hardship. Rather, I fear for you, uh, what I fear for you will be given, that you'll be given the wealth of the world, just as it was given to those before you, the opulence, the grandeur, the resources, it'll be given to you. And you will compete for it, just as those before you competed for it. And it will lead you to ruin, just as it leads them to ruin. And Omar was reinforcing this, that it's only been a few years since the Prophet ﷺ had passed, just a few, uh, a year or so since uh, Abu, Abu Bakr عنه, had passed. And this is where we're at right now. Like, are, are we losing sight of it? And I'll come back to why for Umar عنه, this was a very significant thing for him personally to say because of the, the arc that his journey had taken. But let's fast forward to ourselves right now, January, 2021. We have just emerged from one of, if not the most unusual years of our lives, um, as well as in the modern history of our nation. Many of us have been for the past four years living under a degree of uh, frustration and anxiety and fear, um, particularly given the political situation and the leadership and direction of our country that it was under. Um, now here we are just nine days removed from the transition of a new leadership. And for many of us, those past anxieties have been lifted. We feel as if we can really breathe again. We take a sigh of relief. Um, we, we feel the need to celebrate and we can, uh, we can go back to our noble, we think. Um, what, what the last four years were to us may have just been an aberration or an aberration. We, we, we just kind of think about that. Ah, that's, that's not what we really are, but we think. Social media posts that I've seen and maybe you've seen since the inauguration, um, for the most part outside of the flood of the Bernie memes, which I'm all in on and I'm all for, but they've reflected this euphoria in not just the celebration of a storm that has passed, which we you know, reflected on both the worst as well as the incompatible parts of our nation, um, to more so of a new day, a new day that has brought forth not just a new leadership, but people, brown and black people, women, persons of color, um, and others um, at the margins traditionally brought them to the center. It makes us feel good that we can see another person who looks like us or comes from a background like us be in a position so often historically represented and made up of one race and gender. We feel seen. We feel relational. But Amidst it all, though no doubt many of us have cause to celebrate on these grounds alone, as Muslims, we must be a little bit more cognizant and more cognizant of the full picture. We must understand the limitations though, the limitations that uh, come with such identity politics, which may drown out the discourse of more pressing and deep-seated matters and thus make us feel a little bit more comfortable because superficially we're made to feel good that now someone else looks like me in office, I, I feel good, but I don't, my, my, I, my duty stop there. That's not, that's not what we need to be doing as Muslims. As Muslims, we are taught that in any situation where we are made to feel blessed or too comfortable in those moments in which we are prone to become most complacent is actually when we actually become most accountable. And furthermore, need to not just become accountable, but to hold others and our leaders first and foremost as uh, to account. As Muslims, we are not meant to be uh, the nation or a people of band-aid solutions, satisfied uh, with or just content with that which makes us feel good or just makes us have a slight sense of elation that we've done something. We come from a tradition where our Prophet Sallallahu reminded us that we are not believers if we go to sleep with our stomach filled while our neighbors are hungry, 
Thus, though it has been acculturated for us, myself first and foremost here, we think that our duties are satisfied when we provide a $3 blanket to someone sleeping on the street, on the cold street in a freezing cold night, or a sandwich meal as part of uh, a once in a while thought in our minds that maybe we should care for those of our uh, folks who are homeless once in a month. But that's not to say that there is no merits or blessings or benefit in this. There is immensely. But as Muslims, we don't stop or are satisfied with just that solution. We shouldn't be. Our tradition tells us not to be and our Prophet ﷺ modeled that we, we really can't be. Bandages can only do so much for someone bleeding from a cut or injury, but what about someone who is hemorrhaging from one of their limbs? And what about someone who's hemorrhaging internally, whose, whose pain we don't see, whose blood we don't see, but it's just, it's, it's destroying them. And what, what are we doing? A Band-Aid won't fix that. South African scholar and liberation theologian, uh, Farid Isaac gives a beautiful example of what a Muslim is to do when something akin to some plight befalling their neighbor or a people uh, comes about. And the exact example at the moment eludes me. But along the lines of, if you have a group of people, if you have like a, an encampment of people living at the base of a mountain and regularly you start to see something either coming down from that mountain, if it's like a boulder or something that harms the community, like the water supply begins to uh, become toxified or whatnot, the Muslim is not just the one who goes and now provides healthcare or disaster relief and then leaves knowing that, you know, this very well may happen again um, and then just comes back and helps out again and then leaves. And the cycle just repeats itself that these folks are obviously suffering a cyclical type of trauma, a cyclical uh, type of adversity, um, but we're not putting band-aids on these different things. Um, rather, the Muslim seeks to go to the source of the calamity, go to the top of the mountain and see what is causing all this. What, how can we stop and change it? What is polluting that water? What's causing these rocks to fall? What can we do to tangibly help these people move and alleviate their situation rather than, here's a Band-Aid, I feel good about myself that I did something. What can we do because we're challenged in our, in our very tradition to go to that mountaintop and to see what is up there that is causing this issue? We're, we're not people who are baseline. We're not people who are just satisfied with what's at the base. We are challenged to go up a mountain. If any of y'all have been hiking, you know, for us going to Mountain Benel in Austin is quite of a hike or going to the 360 bridge is like a mountain hike, right? But if you go to like, you know, something a little bit moderate like Enchanted Rock or an actual mountain, um, you know, for a hike, it's it's not easy. It takes multiple hours. You, you, it takes maybe days, um, especially, but it, it takes a process. So it's not something you can instantly just do. Some people can, they can run up a mountain and, you know, that's them. But for the mo for most of us, it takes time to get up there. And this is what the process is like for us that in order to change something, it will take time, but we make that intention to get to that mountaintop. Drawing back to our discussion though at the present, the same applies to us in our current day and age, given the political climate and the historical moment in which we reside. Looking back on the past four years with uh, that, uh, the anxiety that have marked it, uh, we remember the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu to uh, Ibn Abbas an, that young man, I will teach you some words. Be mindful of Allah and he will protect you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find him before you. If you ask, ask from Allah. If you seek help, seek help from Allah. Know, and this is where it's really critical for us, know that if the nation, if the country gathered together to benefit you, they will not benefit you unless Allah has decreed it for you. And if the nation gathers together to harm you, they will not harm you unless Allah has decreed it for you. For verily the pens have been lifted and the pages have been dried. So that which we might experience, whether good or bad from a leader of a government uh, or a government in general, at the end of the day, it's not novel. It's something that has been decreed. Whether that uh, meant a certain celebrity becoming president or a new government which looks slightly more like people like us, these were all matters decreed. Our duty and obligations, though, stay the same in the sense that we continue to not be comfortable and we continue to ask those questions. 
What we can't afford to do, sisters and brothers, is that as much as we might feel elated and relieved at the closing of one of the most unusual chapters in our country's history and in the opening of, the, of a new one, is to become complacent, satisfied, or pacified just because we now feel good, or this is what it used to feel like. This is, this is the status quo. Dr. Cornell West states that, or stated after the election in November, that we, uh, we, we can't really afford to go back to sleep because as much as we might be enthralled or lighthearted uh, with, uh, or elated with leaders whom we align with or people we can relate to politically, socially, or ethnically, we can't risk going back to sleep because when the politics of identity take over our discourse, we cloud our judgment and rationale when it comes to seeing the real issues that still exist, the pressing matters needing rectification, and most importantly, our role as Muslims to be the standard bearers of accountability. Dr. West relates that in the wake of President Obama's reelection, we went to sleep. We went to sleep and that, but that, and as a result, that didn't stop the drones from uh, dropping bombs. It didn't stop the mass incarcerating. It didn't stop the imperial militarism. It didn't stop the deportations and it didn't stop the economic exploitation by corporations. So much so that after we woke up from our sleep, we had a nightmare right after that we woke up to 2016. So it, you see the consequences of, of having this done and what, what can happen if we choose to do so. But again, this khutba is not meant in any way to be a diatribe towards one political party or another, or one leader or another, or so on and so forth. It's simply a reminder that while we might be in a mood of elation right now, or we see a cause to celebrate, and for whatever reasons, as Muslims, we'd be mindful though, that and cognizant that our work is not yet finished. And heck, it hasn't even really started. It's just getting started now. The Prophet hardships did not conclude when he escaped persecution to Medina or when he returned triumphantly to Mecca. As you recall my last khutbah at the end of December, I mentioned the passing of the Prophet Sallam's uh, son, Ibrahim. And do you know when he passed? He passed six months before the Prophet Sallam himself passed. It was the last year the Prophet Sallam was on earth and alive amongst his Sahabi and he passed away. So you see the hardships went well beyond the, the triumph and, and, and the, the glories that uh, the Prophet and the Muslims faced, that hardships even up to the last moment had gone there. And we know at the time of the death of the Prophet that he experienced those pangs of death. Even the most beloved of God had to experience these, uh, this trauma, this, this type of uh, experience, these pangs um, which in which we would argue he should have the most comfortable passing of any of us because of how hard his life was. But even he was tested with that. Now, how about us? And to remind ourselves that even after the wealth poured in, when we go back to the story we opened with, even after the wealth poured in from the lands of Sham or Faris or Misr, from Egypt, from the Levant or from Persia, and from these conquests, Umar radiallahu an had feared that which our Prophet ﷺ had feared for his ummah upon seeing these treasures and spoils of the empire in the midst of their mud brick homes in Medina and how the downfall and fitna of this ummah would not be in times of adversity or times of poverty and hardship, but in the lap of luxury and in the lap of wealth and resource and affluence that amidst this comfort we would lose sight of not only what our true purpose is, but of our duties and responsibilities, and especially those to whom Allah has charged us with being responsible and mindful for. This is, a very, this is very interesting though, when we take into account the story of Umar radiallahu an as a whole, and specifically the well-known hadith when he visits the Prophet in his chamber in the masjid, and he's struck by the austerity and the sheer poverty which marks the Prophet's life. You see a leather um, pillow, uh, you see a cot, you see three hides ha hanging, you see a small pot for water, you have nothing else there. And seeing this, he uh, becomes overcome with tears. And he tells the Prophet ﷺ that while the kings of Persia and Rome have their thrones filled with gold and all the luxuries of the world, he as the Prophet ﷺ should be more entitled to that. And to which the Prophet ﷺ actually gently reminded him that, do you not remember why we're here? Do you not remember why we're here? And don't lose sight of all this, Umar. 
don't lose sight because they've give, they've been given the treasures of this life, but know that we've been given those of the next. So he, he in, in this time, this isn't too long ago. This was still in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar was reminded that even this stuff, someone like Umar who became so austere in his time and so strict with matters like this, he still wrestled with these things as do all of us, but even he needed that gentle reminder. Now, I know what I'm about to say, if, I haven't, if it hasn't been said already, might come across as a little controversial or angled, but again, khutbah is not drafted for the purpose of pushing a specific political persuasion or anything. It's asked that it's done in the service of Allah. And this is simply a call for all of us to reflect, each of us, on where we are in this liminal space of our country's history, our lives, and as Muslims in the spectrum of ongoing history, the ongoing history of Islam in the world. What does this mean for us? This means that when we find ourselves or candidates, political parties, institutions in positions of power or our own organizations, we don't turn down the flame to a low heat because you know, now we're gonna get comfortable. We actually turn, we need to turn that up. We need to turn that heat up a bit because it needs to make us more accountable and voiceful for those who may not have a voice. Because when we're on that pedestal, it's harder to see who all is now, who used to be our peers. We don't, we don't see and we don't hear them. But if we hold ourselves accountable, we know that wherever we may go in life, whatever heights we may be taking, we're still connected to uh, those whom we are around. Instead, if we just become comfortable and we lighten that heat, we'll just kind of be uh, sailing up and we'll forget about a lot of the needs of those in our own community and outside of our community. This means that in our comfort, in our comfort, we don't do things like drown out discourse about real pressing issues by only pushing a narrative built on identity and politics. It means that when even uh, we try to engage in something or we want to engage in something or some activity, we don't do it without questioning and reflecting on it beforehand. And even during it, like, is this right? Is this, what, what is the effects of this? We want to have a holistic approach to it, not just, hey, that sounds good, or that feels good. I'm going to go with that. Not knowing that what consequences does this have if I do take this action? It means in our, uh, in our comfort and bounty, we don't, uh, you know, just completely just go and buy uh, things that we feel like we'll, we'll need or subscribe to things that we need without knowing who are we buying from? Who are we getting these things from? What's, what's behind all this? It means that in our comfort and bounty, we don't do things like take free trips to countries and places that uh, as tourists, where the residents of that very place are oppressed or barred from entry or persecuted, or the government oppresses them. It makes us ask beforehand, what is the consequence of me doing that? And it means that when in our comfort, we don't just give what we can spare to those who may be homeless or in times of need, whether they're our own family or just our neighbors. It means that it means that I'm now asking what is preventing me from bringing that person into my own home or give them shelter if I have the means to do so. What is stopping me at just giving a one tangible item and then leaving? Why can't I do more? And many others. Each of us has different means and capacities according to our own abilities. We have different levels of wealth and resource, different levels of power. We all share though. We all share, apart from the Islam or the belief in Allah, our duty to both the rights of Allah and the rights that are due to Allah, the hukuk Allah, and then the rights that are also due to our fellow human being, the hukuk al-ibad, the fellow uh, man that exists next to us. But what, uh, And we come from a tradition. We come from a tradition where even the poorest among us, when given a small bounty or blessing, would be mindful that they would be accountable for and responsible for not only what they did with that, but how it affected them. And now I want us to just in this closing, just to ask, how about us in our current state where we might feel that our side is now in power and in leadership, steering the ship, whether we are in power or not, like literally, those of us here at the least have been given the voice, the expression, and the outlets to have ourselves heard or the means to at least have ourselves felt or to be influenced or to be influencing. How will we feel when we come to account to Allah with what's been given there? What will we say that we've done with this that has been given to us for those whom Allah has consistently invoked us to be mindful for, whether they're on the margins or they're even our next door neighbors or they're people who don't have a voice? as well as for those 
who are in leadership above us and who maybe actively either oppress or take part in a politic that is harmful to the country or to a specific community, and we don't uh, speak a word of power to them or a word of truth to them, what will we have to show for it? We remember in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ that on that day you will be asked to account for all blessings. And the Prophet ﷺ related this incident at a time when he was sitting hungrily outside uh, his home in Medina with his companions Abu Bakr عن, and Umar عن, and he was sitting there and they were provided with some food uh, by a Sahabi um, who brought them into their home. Again, they're just starving and uh, this person provides them uh, with the little food that he can. And he, before uh, they even conclude their meal, he reminds them of this blessing that Allah will, uh, will ask them about. So that was like a piece of a lamb. What about us with this privilege that we've had here? Inshallah, we'll talk a little bit more in the next, uh, the next section here. I say these words of mine and I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in. Uh, brothers and sisters, I, I, to be honest, this part of the khutbah I've left mostly blank uh, intentionally because I didn't know what to make of this as I was sitting in front uh, of, of the mirror and just uh, you know, uh, jotting all this down. But I, I want us to just be a little bit of a moment for reflect. A lot of things have been said. A lot of things have been brought up. And I know that if 2021 has been anything. It's probably been a year of the feels where we've been in different emotions every single day. Um, if you're following the stock market, you're probably also going up and down with like GameStop and or GameStop and all that stuff. Um, and so, you know, th this is just a call for let's let's take that 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 let's take that step. Just a, a a pausing moment. You know, this has been one of the busiest weeks in my life, just with that other stuff going on. Um, and I haven't had a moment to truly pause until today and just. You're like, okay, where am I in all this? And this was the one thing that was kind of nagging on me. But I, I want us to remember that in these matters, in whatever it may be in our life, um, if it's the busiest part, if it's something that we're feeling down about, if it's something that we're feeling great about, um, we've got uh, a verse from the Quran in which Allah uh, reminds us, Allah says, say, O oh Allah, owner of sovereignty, you uh, give sovereignty to whom you will and you take away sovereignty from who you will. You honor whom you will and you humble whom you will. In your hands is all good. Indeed, you are over all things complete. And so I just want us to, as we close out here, just to reflect that um, where we are at our present moment, we are all in different spaces. We are all in different places. We uh, are in different situations, whether we're talking about uh, our work life, economically, socially, we're all in different places here. We all though have a common bond. We all have a common bond back to the Prophet Sallallahu to the religion that was given to us um, through him. And we all have a common bond to that. And at the least, what we can do, wherever we maybe are, if we are on the, the pedestals of society or if we're just down at the baseline, we all have that same level of accountability. And those who are uh, have been blessed with more have been given more accountability. In Islam, when you're given something with blessings, when you're given something with wealth, you are more and more accountable for it. This is something that we see in the lives, not of the, all of the khulafa, but of our Prophet Sallallahu himself. When he would... Uh, talk to his wife when he would see, you know, silver uh, jewelry on her and, uh, and, and, and say that, you know, have, have you paid the zakah on it? Have, he, he's, he's mindful that even though he himself, the prophet of Allah, is still there in his room, uh, standing in the late hours until his feet are swollen. If someone like that, who communicated directly with Allah, who uh, had revelation coming directly uh, from Allah, from the heavens, through Jibreel, and has this uh, beloved stature, is the Habibullah, what does that say about us as we are so far removed, but we're so still connected, how we conduct ourselves? And I hope that the character, the reminder of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminds us that wherever we might be, in whatever position we may be, 
at the end of the day, we all will be gathered in front of Allah and we will still be asked about what we've been given, whether it's a morsel of a date that's given to us when we're hungry, or if it's a political station of power, or if we're not the ones in power, we are part of the, the, the powering or the governing people. And if we're not a part of the governing people, we're part of the party of the people, the, the Shia too of the party, um, the, that, that we are now assembled as that. And so what, what, what levels of accountability do we have? But we will still be asked about these. And I'll close with a, uh, uh, with a recitation of uh, Surah Al-Duha, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, Alam yajidika yatima fala tanhar. That Allah says that did he not find you an orphan and give you shelter? He's talking to the Prophet in this uh, in this surah. But when we look at it applying to us, what does an orphan mean for us in, in this world? If we are without Islam, maybe in, in a part of the world or we're just detached from our community or just as a whole, we are orphaned from that, that uh, collective community um, of, of the Prophet or from the true teachings that we're, we're just separate. So did he not find us an orphan and give us some kind of shelter? Did he not find you wandering and give you guidance? And he found thee in need and made thee independent. And therefore, do not treat the orphan with harshness. Allah reminds us, do not treat those at the margins. Don't forget about them. Don't, don't stop thinking about them. Don't rebuke them when you've come to power. Remember them. And don't repulse the petitioner, the unheard. Don't, don't forget that while you're in this position, you've forgotten the people who have helped get you there and the people who have the voice, um, who are now voiceless while you have a voice. And the bounty of Allah, rehearse and proclaim. Inshallah, brothers and sisters, I hope that uh, my words, I want to ask first and foremost for forgiveness for uh, if I offended anyone with any, um, with any statements and whatnot. But this is, like I said, as I was composing this, it was literally in front of kind of a mirror and just thinking, what am I going to say to myself? And there's a lot of things going on for us. And there's a lot of things uh, that are happening in the world. And this is by no means a uh, affront to anyone. Uh, specifically, this is a first and foremost call to me and to everyone else that may be here, maybe outside. What can we do uh, to, to make the most of what we've been giving in this time? Because we know that uh, over 400,000 of us in this country have not been able to uh, have this reflection today and more and more by each day. So what can we do with that time we're given for however much we're given? I would like to uh, just closing ask uh, for some small dua. So um, as you are able, if it, uh, you see fit, but we want to ask Allah first and foremost for uh, the consistent companionship of Allah, the consistent hidayah, the guidance that Allah bestows upon us in a year that is new, that may be refreshing for us as 2021. We ask Allah for uh, the future year, this year that's coming here, um, to be a year of growth, not just for us as em uh, in emotional beings, but spiritual beings as well, that this may be a year that we find a way to repair our connection with Allah for whatever may have been damaged in the years before. We ask Allah for any, uh, for, for all forgiveness for any of our shortcomings this past year. And we ask Allah to engender a love uh, for the messenger of Allah in our hearts. We ask Allah for peace and justice to prevail for those who are wronged or victimized. And we ask Allah to be, uh, allow us to be enablers of such justice um, towards the, uh, to, to confront this injustice. And we ask Allah to comfort the person who may be oppressed the person who may be uh, alone, the person who may be hungry uh, or isolated or may be searching, that may the person who's searching find, and that may the person who's hungry be fed, and that may the person who cannot see be given sight, and that may we, and all these things, and not just Allah be the one who bestows these, but through us, enables us to get the reward to be those things. I, in, in, in this dua, it actually just makes me reflect. I, I was reading uh, in uh, Dr. Isak's book, uh, there was a, uh, a, a short um, uh, narrative that was mentioned, which a person uh, had gone 
around. He was just telling a story that uh, he sees all these children crying for uh, help that, that are saying, uh, we're hungry, feed us. And this man now starts to cry to Allah and says, why is Allah not feeding them? Not knowing that the children are uh, actually a reflection of Allah saying, why is this man not feeding us? So may we be mindful of what, where we are and what we complain about, what our situation is and what is at our disposal so that we may be these tools for help. And lastly, we ask Allah uh, to alleviate all the, uh, the sufferings of uh, anyone who's going through this, uh, not just this pandemic, but through this time of transition, physically, mentally, economically, and allow us again to be the facilitators of this alleviation, uh, and that the wounds we experience, this is what I concluded with last time, but that we ask our experiences and our setbacks and our wounds that we've experienced, whether in this time, last month, 10 days ago, whatever it may be, these allow us to heal the world around us, heal ourselves as well, and that way, may we leave this Juma and this month better than we entered it. Rabbana la tuakhidna inna sina aw akhta'na. Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala alladhina min qablina. Rabbana wa la tuhammilna ma la taqata lana bi. Wa'afu anna wa ghfir lana warhamna anta maulana fansurna ala alqawmil kafirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahima wa ala ala Ibrahima inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahima wa ala ala Ibrahima innaka hamidun majid. Ameen. Jazakla khair, brothers and sisters. And again, Jumma Mubarak to you all. Jazakallah, Usama, for a uh, fantastic khutbah, um, incredible reminders, incredible calls to action. Uh, so I thank you so much for that.